Okay, there we go. All right, thank you for reminding me. So anyway, I was saying that I'm just feel like at, at loose ends with so much going on, but actually there's opportunities as well as distraction, but there's certainly plenty of distraction. So personally, I will feel absolutely delighted when this election season is over. Uh, more than any other time, I am like really at loose ends uh, and with anxiety. And I, I don't know what I'm going to do. My wife and I are going to probably have to do something sane on election day. And of course, we're not going to hear about it for maybe a week or so. So who knows? But um, I just want to acknowledge that there's a lot of uh, anxiety and stress and um the other thing is I want to talk to each one of you for maybe 30, 40 minutes on the phone or on Zoom and really tune into what your needs are and try to fit them to uh, what our opportunities are. I'm going to talk about a few of them today. We've talked about doing interviews uh, regarding uh, internet uh, access, uh, access to digital platforms for school kids and for prisoners, ex-prisoners or people who are previously in uh, in, in, um, incarcerated. So um, anyway, there's others things I just want to talk with you and make sure you feel like your needs are being met uh, and that we're doing as good a job as we can to do that. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to uh, go through a few of the things that are going on and maybe we can talk about that later. Uh, so please send me an email sometime this week when we can chat for 30 minutes on the phone. Uh, very informal and it's entirely, it should, should not be uh, painful or, or difficult. Uh, I just wanna make sure that we're uh, on the same wavelength and uh, you guys are uh, getting the things you need because it is so distracted. Some of you aren't even here in Ann Arbor and uh, it's really hard to um, keep a personal uh, touch and relationship uh, when we do it remotely. So we need to, we need to patch up some of the, the gaps in relationship building and talk just for a little bit. Um, so that's kind of, that's your midterm exam. If it's midterm exam, that'll be your midterm exam. Talk to me sometime this week for 30 minutes. Um, I'm just joking, of course. Um, candidate surveys. We have just, you should, I think I sent the candidate survey, uh, the, re, the results of that. Have, I, have any of you received by email the results of our candidate survey? So I, I will send that. I, I've sent it to just about everyone else I know, so I apologize. NAMI and the Washington Health Initiative uh, sent surveys to 57 candidates running for office. We just now published the results there. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the email and the document. Um, it's really taken a lot of time and effort. And uh, this asks people about issues for justice and human services. Uh, and um, there are about six questions. Um, and we're gonna be discussing this survey and what to do with it and the results of it at a meeting, uh, meet two meetings, and you can attend either or both. And the, the first meeting is on Friday, this Friday at um, 5 uh, p.m. Um, and you will get the notice of that, um, it, no, 4 p.m. Uh, and uh, I'll give you the Zoom notification. Uh, it's called the Collaborators Review, What We've Learned from the Justice and Human Service Surveys. Um, four to 440, should be 40 minutes, Friday, October 30th, and then another meeting after the election on November 6th, I believe it is, uh, which is the next Friday. Uh, yes, November 6th. Um, at these meetings, uh, it's going to be an open discussion about how to use these, this information from the surveys and what to do next with it. Uh, so there, we've got some pretty good uh, ideas about what to do with that. It has to do with identifying knowledge gaps, really what we're looking at are knowledge gaps in candidates, uh, local candidates for office in Washtenaw County, 
regarding their notions of justice and human services. Now, uh, that sounds a little stark. It's not like they have a, a knowledge gap about justice, but it, it, they do have knowledge gaps about human services. So it's going to be discussing the, um, the import of, of these surveys and what to do next. And we're thinking of really engaging uh, all of our candidates for public office in getting some kind of information about where their knowledge, limits of knowledge are. I, I don't know if you've ever been to public uh, meetings, but public office holders are expected to know a tremendous amount about everything from road repair to police, to human services, to zoning, to everything. Uh, and we have to do a better job of educating them about our topics, which are justice and human services. So we're going to really focus and double down on that. Uh, our partners of that will be the Washtenaw Housing Alliance and other human service organizations. So if you choose to become involved with that, either during project outreach or in subsequent terms, you can continue to be involved and you can have a exposure to a wide range of human service organizations as well as um, criminal justice organizations like courts, police, and the prosecutor's office. So that's those two meetings. Uh, I urge you to come to those, look at what we did with the surveys, and see um, where you can identify the knowledge gaps of the people who responded. Um, the other uh, thing that we're going to be doing that I want to offer you participation in, and we can discuss when we talk uh, by telephone, is the, the millage campaign is now in its final stages. Uh, the millage will be voted on November 3rd. We think it's going to pass. Uh, we're definitely going to do a, 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 a summary or a, a compilation of what we learned over the last two millage uh, efforts. The first millage was in 2017 for public safety and mental health services. Uh, uh, and then this millage is on how affordable and uh, supported housing. These were some of the same people who are involved in both millages and we're gonna put together some documents uh, as much as we can about how, how this happened and who did what and how it worked and what worked and didn't work. If you wanna be involved with that, that should be a really interesting thing for people who are interested in advocacy for uh, funding advocacy at the local level. So, uh, that's another opportunity. Um, we're, next week, I'm gonna ask one of our NAMI people, uh, Gizem, her name is, first name is Gizem. Uh, she's on the Criminal Justice uh, Review Board with the uh, Sheriff's Department, and she's gonna talk to us about criminal justice reform. Uh, so, uh, and she'll probably have some opportunity if you wanna get engaged there. Uh, and now, so that's kind of the list of things of, that I wanna talk with you and explain more about individually and see where uh, if they, they'll fit your needs or if you have other interests as well. NAMI is a pretty diverse organization and we wanna make sure that uh, you get an opportunity to uh, reap as much as you can from uh, your association with it. Anybody got questions? Lauren, Maggie, no, no shaking, no, okay. Um, that's good. So. What I'm gonna do now, uh, and I'm sorry to be so rushed, but I wanna finish off what we were discussing about uh, interview techniques, and let's set the stage for this. What I'd really like everyone to do uh, for uh, in common is to get some experience with interviewing people from your local school that is, you know, many of you are two or three years out of school, you still know people, you know teachers, you know staff, you perhaps know students and certainly know parents who are involved in right now in this uh, new education experience that we're all, you know, working under, which is the remote education experience uh, that schools are engaged in. Um, and what we want to do is try to, as we've talked about it before, try to address the um, mental health and knee and, and knowledge needs of people who are exposed to remote platforms now, but where they previously may never have had any exposure before. Uh, and we're trying to get an idea about how can we 
ease and promote the transition to remote uh, to remote learning to remote activity because it seems like this is going to continue into the future. This is not just a one-off thing. Um, so uh, I think we really have to take seriously that there are people who have never had exposure to um, to these uh, technologies and to the, this, these skills that are involved with them. And we, uh, we need to learn as much as we can about what they think about it, whether they trust it, whether they like it, what they're struggling with, what are the things that will boost their use and what are the barriers that will diminish their use. Because it's going to make a big difference in terms of our capacity to, to meet the needs of a diverse population. We can't just rely on the fact that by some good fortune, everybody we deal with that needs help has had experience with uh, remote uh, platforms like Zoom and like what we're doing right now. We have to we have to take seriously that this is a real gap and a real problem. So these interviews are trying to begin to develop a, a basis for understanding that. Um, so. Uh, and we've talked about this before in prior sessions, and those have been recorded, and you can go back and get them. And I can, if you want, I can send you the the, the documents we've used uh, to to present the issues if you're you're fuzzy on them. So right now, I want to share my screen, and I want to talk to you about this article that I asked you all to read, which was a reading and discussion guide on. Uh, a man named Spradley, who is an ethnographer, uh, which is like an anthropologist, who um, I wrote some notes on. So you're not reading his article, you're reading my notes of his article, but it really summarizes things. Uh, and I found that the summary is easier to read than just the true article. The article, as the book actually is on our shared drive. If you want to read that, uh, it's perfectly readable, nothing wrong with it. So for the first thing, everybody okay with this? Uh, you want to ask some questions or say, you know, make a comment like I'm talking too fast or too slow or, <laughs> okay, cool. Um, Spradley is an ethnographer and ethnographers like anthropologists uh, go to other cultures and uh, the, we, I, the reason I like the fact that we're dealing with it as if it were another culture, that is asking people questions by, and assume that we don't know anything about what they've experienced, is that so often with mental health services, people who don't have experience with mental health services assume that they understand or bring presumptions or stereotypes about what those services are and those, those conditions are they really need to be that really needs to be questioned and so we're applying that same approach to this issue of using remote technologies that is we don't really and i'll make the argument that it's it's been so long since i am not a digital native it's been so long since i first learned uh, about using computers and remote technology that i can't remember what it was like not knowing there are many things that that uh, I presume, and when I and you run across this when you try to take someone who has no experience with them and teach them, you realize that there's a lot of skills involved and a lot of presumptions that you can make that are incorrect. So that's the point of treating it as if you're an ethnographer, and that means that the person you're dealing with, unlike a social science perspective, the person you're dealing with is an informant, which is a very strange word for us to use. But I, the informant really is the expert. It, it flips the script on who's the expert and who's the subject of the, of, of the conversation. The informant becomes the expert. They know their experience and their knowledge and they're telling you and you're the one that has to learn. The, the ethnographer is the one that has to learn. That's a very important concept for people to take in dealing with mental health services because so often after we learn a little bit about mental health conditions, we assume we know a lot more than we do. 
And they're so complex and so different and diverse that it's better, I think, th the message here is it's really better to assume you know nothing about them and treat everyone as if they're informing you about what these things are. That has additional benefits because it builds trust and uh, it builds a relationship that is extraordinarily useful in working with people. You can't really work with uh, people in social services and not have a real bond of trust and mutual uh, respect. And it builds this mutual respect by, tr by having this notion of you're, a, you're, a, you're an ethnographer and they're an informant. The object, the opposite or the, uh, the other side of that is this the typical social science perspective, which treats the person who's asking the questions as the expert or the interviewer, the expert, and the other person as the subject. And just the word subject <clears throat> is almost, uh, it's a subservient relationship. You know, you, all you want to know is, you know, how frequently when they do certain things and they tick off boxes. They really are not co-participants in any way in the knowledge that you're creating. So what we want to do is develop this notion of co-participation and we don't want subjects, we don't want clients, we don't even want consumers, which are often the words that people use to refer to people who are in less power than the professional. We really want to treat them as informants, as co-equal and as knowledgeable in ways that we're not. It's just flipping the script uh, on the typical social science approach. Now, I'm not against social science. I, I was trained in social sciences. I've done my share of surveys. Uh, and and I know you know standard deviations, and I can I can talk about degrees of freedom. I'm not against that, <clears throat> but I th I don't think it's everything. And I think certain points in creation of knowledge, you have to take this point of view that you really need co-participants, and you're starting from scratch. And that's what we're doing here. If you know, if you look, have you if you look through um, the. Uh, internet on knowledge, notions about the uh, knowledge gap or the, the uh, digital uh, gap, you'll see that what they're really talking about mostly is the lack of equipment. They're really not talking about the fact that people have different needs. They're gonna use this in different ways. They're not talking about the important content uses for this information. It's just too complex. Uh, and people haven't really come around to discuss it. And now we're at the point where we really have to say, figure out why people want to use this stuff and how can we get them to use it and expand their use so that they can be co-participants in our culture. Otherwise, people who don't have this grasp, this intuitive grasp that we all have now about digital platforms, they're just going to be left out. And they're not going to get medical care that the rest of us get. They're not gonna get social service care. They're not gonna find jobs. They're not gonna find, they're not gonna, they're gonna be disadvantaged in educational platforms, everything. Um, so that's the pitch. Um, so the, uh, what also is forces us to think about is what is our role? What, what role, if we're playing the role of an ethnographer, that is a person coming into a culture who doesn't know anything about it. It's a bit of a metaphor. It's not really true. We know a lot about cultures and we know a lot about people and we've had experience. So it is playing a role, but it's a useful role to play because it makes fewer presumptions about what we're trying to get at than uh, any other one. So I admit it's a bit of a stretch and it's only a metaphor, but I think it's a useful one. Okay, so <clears throat> any ideas, any comments about that? Or do you feel like that's too, uh, you know, too abstract? Uh, Maggie, what do you think? I'm not sure. Yeah, let me process it for a little bit, but and nothing came up like no reflex. So I, I agree with that. Yeah, it is a bit of a flip of the way we're usually taught in psychology and sociology. So I must I must agree with you. Let it let it germinate a little bit. Um, 
Uh, Lauren, do you have any uh, comments? Does this feel good to you or does this feel a little strange? Yeah, this is very, um, I don't want to say normal, but I'm used to it. One of okay. my other minors is SOCH. So like one of the first things we did in SOCH 101 or 100 was to do an ethnography oh, of the really? space. Yeah, it was really smart. I think that was like a really smart idea because you know, people aren't very used to just sitting there and observing the space. This is what we did for ours. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up like other classes I've taken, I've done interviews for stuff. We did interviews for this class. Okay. So I think I'm fairly comfortable with the idea of not knowing everything, especially in the space that I'm not um, usually in. Okay. Okay. That's very helpful because like, I don't know what you guys have seen. So, you know, this, so to you, it may feel really familiar to others. It may not. Caitlin, do you have any um, reactions? No, I think I agree with everything Lauren said. Um, okay. When I, did research last year. That's pretty much what we did. We did interviews with people and just listening to their experiences. Mm -hmm. So, okay, okay. So I'll just go through this, and um, and then if you want to talk about it more, we can talk about it more offline. Um, but I want to be mindful of our time. So the first step in the, in this in, in this process is to develop rapport. If you're going to call up and oh, <clears throat> one of the things that I do want to share with you is um is uh an initial interview uh where is it a uh, short script now this is where it really does get concrete and i think it may be very helpful um so i'm going to do that right now before we get into some of the uh details i'm going to share my screen i will send this to you uh oh, here we go okay uh, here's this script, short script for introducing yourself in an interview. Um, the initial steps are really some of the most important ones. Um, you know, obviously you want to do an introduction. Uh, the second point is you want to make a longer explanation about what you're doing. You want to develop a consent agreement. That's going to be a little awkward, but it's important. Uh, the fourth is you want to focus on the topic and, and this I've done for one of our group of, of people. So um, this pretty much takes you through the entire interview. So obviously you wanna tell them who you are. Uh, and these, this is a script you can modify, of course. I'm working with, the, with NAMI Washtenaw and the University of Michigan on a project to understand people, people's use of computers, smartphones, and the internet for essential activities during the COVID crisis, like, employment, education, shopping, and socializing. The, the, the um, syntax is a little awkward there, so you might want to change that, but you get the idea. Um, I really think we need to put this in the context of COVID. There is no point in not doing that because that, is, if, if you, you don't want to go into a, an interview outside the context of the most important thing that's happening in people's lives, which is COVID. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's why I put that in there. Then you say, you're asked in the introduction, do you have 20 minutes to talk? If, if it's not, you know, if you don't, when is a better time? So that's pretty straightforward. That only takes a couple of seconds. Um, and they can say, yeah, I have time to talk. I can talk to you for 20 minutes. Hopefully that'll be the answer. Uh, the longer explanation is designed to engage with the, the informant and to decrease apprehension. You want to do give them something personal about yourself and your purpose. I'm a student at U of M from, you know, Saginaw, from Portobello, um, from, uh, you know, uh, New York City. In my X year, second year, uh, which has been really unsettled, or your word for that, by the pandemic, COVID-19. Again, situating this whole thing within COVID. Everyone in my family is safe and healthy, but my life has been much more difficult since March. Now, you can put a, your information in there. My family is safe and healthy. You may want to put in, my family has struggled with it. Uh, we've had several infections. I think you want to offer some real information to people. <clears throat> Because that is really a key part in getting decreasing apprehension and engaging people in the way that you want, want to engage them. 
then you can ask about their general health. How has COVID-19 affected you? Are you healthy and safe? Do you have school-aged children? How have they been doing during this period? You know, to, you know, just take a few minutes to discuss how everyone is. I can't tell you how important it is to start every damn conversation that way. I mean, if I talk to my executive, our executive director, excuse me, uh, for NAMI, I'll start with how you doing? How's your family? You know, it's not trivial. Uh, and it's really important and it helps you ground and it really gets beyond the, you know, we're in such a hurry now and we don't have the personal engagement that in-person contacts. This extra effort is really, I think, important. You can repeat and elaborate on the reasons for the interview. Uh, I can send you the first interview slides, which go into that. Uh, we've talked about it a lot. <clears throat> You can say, you know, I'm really, we're really concerned that uh, we need to, you know, that uh, that so the human services are NAMI. <clears throat> it needs to diversify its uh, and the people it's working with. It'll, it'll never do it if we just rely on people who uh, uh, assumptions that people have uh, digital technology and the knowledge they need to do that. So just elaborate somewhat. Then the consent agreement. <clears throat> This is going to be a dis disruption in the process of chatting, but I think it, it's almost impossible to get around. It is, in fact, impossible to get around. And I want to show you now the consent agreement that we have developed. It, can you, is that changed? Is it, can you see this consent agreement now? Yeah, okay. Uh, it has NAMI's. Uh, <clears throat> now, you're going to be doing this remotely. So you can't hand them a piece of paper like we usually do. You can, we can email this. I will give this to you by email. You can email it to them uh, after the interview, but really you have to do just a verbal consent. And it pays just to read it through. Now I've done this a bunch of times and you think this is boring and the people are interested and some, most of the people aren't interested. It's like signing, the, cons the agreement for uh, uses for all the software we ever buy. Nobody reads that stuff, but there are a lot of people who actually are interested in this stuff. <clears throat> so this says, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness and Project Outreach in the University of Michigan Psychology Department are partnering to get your experience and opinions about remote technology during the COVID-19 pandemic. Your participation in our interviews is entirely voluntary and confidential. You may choose to participate as you wish or not at all. Although we do not expect this information to come up, we are obligated by NAMI policies to report suspected abuse of another person or another criminal activity uh, or any other criminal activity. In case you do participate, NAMI Washington wants you to know that we will make an audio recording of our interview. We respect your right to privacy. We'll use this audio recording to make a written transcript in order to compile the information and to fulfill NAMI's mission of education, support, and advocacy. The recording and your comments will be kept confidential and your name will not be associated with your comments unless you give a separate written permission. <clears throat> NAMI Washington also seeks your consent to keep in touch so we can ask you to participate in other events. We also want to tell you about NAMI programs and opportunities by phone or email. Please check the appropriate boxes and sign below. You know, I understand that my participation is voluntary and I agree to immediately raise any concerns I might have. If I have questions after the day, I can contact Mark Creekmore and there's my phone number or through the NAMI offices. Then check, I understand this session may be audio recorded, and then the check is, I agree, you may contact me in the future. If they don't check the audio recording, then just you can't audio record it. If they don't want to participate, you know, thank them profusely for you're taking them time <clears throat> to talk. And, um, you know, uh, and they may not want to be contacted, and that's fine too. So I said, do you want me to send, ask them, do you want me to send this to you by email? And then you can send this to them so they can have my address and phone number. And uh, that's the consent agreement. Now, while it does really disrupt the, I'm gonna go back to, uh, <clears throat> uh, while it really disrupts the process, it's an important disruption because you're saying to them, 
this is a really formal role and that I'm going to take seriously. <laughs> so this is not, you know, and you may be talking to people you know. You may be talking to a, a student that you know, a, a parent that you know, a staff member in the school that you know. You're communicating the, to them this, that you're not really talking to them as the old person they knew. You're in a new role and th there are limits on this role and you'll respect them. So that's one of the really important uses of this. <clears throat> the other po point that's important, I think, in consent is that you're really telling them you take this stuff seriously and that you are taking the time and effort to really make sure that nothing goes wrong and that their rights and, and you're respecting their input. So it's really, in a way, a sign of respect. Um, it's awkward, but I think it's, it pays off. And of course, it's going to keep us all out of trouble uh, because uh, we really try to live up. We do live up to this. There's no question about it. Uh, we do this all the time with our, our storytelling. When we tell people, if you don't give us consent, if you withdraw your consent, we won't use your story. If you give us consent to do it, use it in one place, we'll use it only in that place and not in any other place unless you consent to the change. So we really work very hard. <clears throat> to make sure that people we take we communicate how serious we take this stuff any questions i mean you guys must have seen this stuff so i'm uh, i'm i'm probably talking to the to twice uh, twice saved as my 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 father used to talk, say um okay so we got the consent out of the way so now we're down to the topics. Now we may be 10, in, 10 minutes into your 20 minute, but here's what you do. Be mindful of the amount of time you're using. <clears throat> and if you're longer than 20 minutes, ask them if you can continue. That's all you have to do. Uh, and don't hesitate to suggest talking later. So they say, well, I've got, you know, my dog needs to go out or I need to pick up my <clears throat> son or daughter from their ballet lesson or, you know, their soccer practice. You can say, look, I, I can call you, we can talk later. <clears throat> this is, that's no problem. Um, so uh, that's what you do there. Um, so let's imagine we're talking to parents of school age children. And <clears throat> uh, so I think we've addressed in this whole introductory process, the idea of, of uh, uh, getting people the apprehension of people should be pretty well stamped down they should know why you're doing this and they should have a good feeling that you're taking all this stuff seriously and you're taking them seriously so the apprehension thing and the rapport should be pretty well established by now um, but you may have to make repeated explanations and you know just don't hesitate to do that and take the time um so here's really the meat of the of the story here <clears throat> is that it is asking descriptive questions and if you uh, you know it sounded like i think lauren you said you were doing observations that's certainly one form of ethnography is just observing and writing down uh the other is asking questions and um there's a kind of uh, um, shortcut knowledge about ethnography that uh, you, you don't necessarily know the questions to ask. So you want them to describe, to be descriptive. <clears throat> um, if you take in, ex, contrast this with a survey, when you give per person your survey, you know exactly the questions you want to ask, and you know the the framework you want to put them in, and and the responses they give, and they just you just tick off the boxes. <clears throat> you know how many times in the last week have you uh, <clears throat> smoked a cigarette? Well, you know cigarettes are important. You know that what what the appropriate level is, and you can make conclusions about whether a person is a heavy smoker or a light smoker based on their answer, as, as an example. Um, in descriptive questions, you don't really know the questions, so you want them to describe what they do. This is really the meat of, of uh, our use of the word, the notion ethnography. 
So in uh, there's a whole section in this in this set of uh, in this uh, set of things about descriptive questions. It's at the bottom of page three. It says ask descriptive questions. Um, and let me run through them with you. Some of them are grand, they call them grand tour questions. Um, so you, you, um, you ask people to walk through a tour of a period of time and tell you all about it. There are many, many small tour questions, which are smaller scale than the grand tour. There's example questions. <clears throat> uh, can you give them an example of why some, you said something? That's asking for a descriptive example. There are experience questions. Can you recall any experiences where you've had a question, uh, a, 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 something that's upset you or things like that? You're asking people for their experiences. Sometimes there are questions about their use of language. Uh, that's often a, a very useful one. Can you give me other words that you would be that you would use uh, when you say when I, you say well, your my kid was acting crazy uh, during his um, Zoom class with his teacher? I said, can you give me other words of the, the, that say the same thing as crazy? You know when you give me some other words for that and they'll say well he was running around the table screaming at the top of his lungs so you ask people to give you uh question uh, uh answers that use different language um so there's a number of these um so uh the the real thing that you want to avoid in descriptive questions is the question that we often really want to know, but it's it's sort of a, very, a big mistake to do it, is why people do things. And I think you want to avoid using the word why as much as you possibly can. Of course you want to know why, why your child was acting crazy, uh, but that presumes you understand what she meant when the, she said or he said that the child was acting crazy. Um, so the why question jumps to the end of the queue, but you want the descriptions that lead up to that. Um, so can you give me a mini tour of a typical school day is one question. We're especially interested in your child's use of computer notebooks and remote learning. And really go right from when the child walks, gets up, you know, takes, a, a, has breakfast. Maybe they have breakfast over their computer. You know, if you all know that's like a terrible idea, but you know, uh, a lot of people don't draw boundaries and it can be an important piece of information that you have a child who's just awakened just sitting down with a bowl of cereal and is leaning is eating over the keyboard or the computer. It gives you a completely different message about how they're using uh, this technology versus a child who has done all these things more or less in separate sequences. So you can see how that might be a useful bit of information. It's not a judgment. We're not saying that one is right and one is wrong. Uh, it's just, that it's it's important distinction and um so you're not implying any kind of attribution but it's important to know uh you pro and another question is you probably had some interesting moments and experiences with this new schooling can you recall any of them that's a that is a very open-ended question you're like asking a parent if they've had some interesting moments and experiences with schooling and letting them pick those moments out. Um, the third question, descriptive question is, can you describe when your child has, your child has used computers or smartphones to keep in touch with their friends? Uh, one of the things I think we are interested in is the degree of social isolation and whether or not uh, they're using this in a balanced way. If you will, 
so that leads some interesting information. And then the fourth question that I'm suggesting is, can you describe when you have used computers or smartphones to keep in touch with your child's teachers in schools? Um, so it's really covering how do the kids use this stuff when they're learning? Do they use it to keep in touch with their friends? And how does that, can you to please describe what that looks like? Um, and then have you done it and please describe how you've used it to keep them in touch with people at school. Um, so it's gonna, it should give us some really rich information and it's all descriptive. Now, <clears throat> how am I doing on time? 145. Um, and then you can ask them things like, do you mind if I ask you about your, and again, this, use of do you mind is intentional. Um, each question is do you mind? And I think that I, I want to be intentional about really asking permission at every stage. So you're really engaging a person and getting their consent at each point. Do you mind if I ask you about your own use of computers or smartphones? And then you can ask descriptive questions about that, similar to the other descriptive questions. And regarding employment, education, social contexts, and shopping, those were the four that I thought were probably pretty important because, uh, but they could, uh, so you can, you're, you don't feel, you shouldn't feel bound by asking in a strict way, but this is the kind of information we're looking for. So we not only want to know how their children use it, we want to know how they use it. And, and, you know, you can say, well, I've never, I'm not, I'm not employed. Uh, you know, I use it to look up things that I want to know for education, you know, education broadly, not just schools. Um, I use it to keep in touch with my family or not. Um, uh, or, or, you know, it, you could ask, do you ever do Zoom meetings with your family? Do you ever call people using your computer? I think smartphones and computers are, we can just try to use those pretty simultaneously. Uh, and uh, shopping uh, as well. So, you know, these are all the ways we use them. What we really know to know is, is do they use them in similar ways? And, and again, we're asking for descriptive questions. We're not, uh, we're not asking, you know, how many times or, you know, we're asking, how do you do, you, you know, have you, can you describe how you've used it for employment? Can you describe how you use it for education? Uh, and uh, the last question, it gets more at an assessment way. So we're really leaving the world of description. Do you mind if I ask you how you would like to change your use of computers or smartphones? And this is asking them for their own assessment as opposed to describing their own use. So those are examples <clears throat> of the kind of approach, uh, ethnographic approach. Um, so let me, let's get some reaction. What do you think? Does it make sense? Yeah, I see one head shaking. Okay. Um, I'm really eager, and, and, and again, it's just, the reason you have to record this is you will never be able to keep notes uh, as you interview. Um, and of course, it means that you have to transcribe that. So I'm not expecting people to do more than one or two interviews. So, you know, you should realize that uh, for every hour, for every 30 minutes of an interview, you may spend 45 minutes to an hour transcribing it. So there's almost as much time spent in writing it up as, but if you don't write it up, it never gets shared. It's the only way to share the information. So uh, that's the, the real cost of, a, of an interview is, uh, is how do you convey that information? And uh, being able to pretty much verbatim, not every uh, um and ah uh, and, you know, uh, not every stage direction detail, but just what you're really focusing on is, is the, the content. 
I'm really interested in in hearing from people as who have different viewpoints of this. So, you know, uh, I think how do you select the people that you want to interview? I think you should think about someone who is really outside of your uh, your everyday life. So I wouldn't interview your sister or brother or, you know, your uncle or aunt, uh, because they're going to be, I guess, pretty similar to you. Uh, you might interview a cousin. It's going to be a little weird because they're going to think you're, 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 on, you're on a trip, you know, playing this role. So it's a little hard to interview friends and relatives using this, these techniques because they're, they seem artificial. But you can do it if you uh, just realize that. So maybe uh, you could ask the same kind of information from uh, of school age children. I've, I've indicated some of that. And you can ask the same information from uh, staff. Uh, so you, you can ad adapt these, this form of questions to educational parents, uh, children or staff, teachers. Um, and, um, you know, in the case of the teachers, you would be asking them, go, please, you know, go through a day when you teach a class, like how you do it. Um, and that may be really interesting because you're going to get the inside dope on how a teacher actually runs a, a simultaneous learning class with 10, 20, kids in different situations and different levels of attention that's going to be fascinating um, and really important information for us to know so that's the idea what do you think you can, uh, what i'd like to do is suggest that we not do these these interviews separately but that we do them in teams but i'm i'm willing to you know negotiate on that if you want to it, you know, it's going to be hard to get a team together, but you could with a Zoom call. Um, so what do you think? I'll set up and... Caitlin, what's your reaction to all this? Um, I think that, um, you know, like those who are able to, you know, and they want to, like, do a team thing, then great. But, um, like, I know personally, like, I... I have like a couple of like old teachers on my Facebook. So, you know, like I have like people that I know that it, like I can reach out to and it would just be easier to, you know, set up a meeting like on my own than try sure. to coordinate with another person. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm fine with that. I do, I do want to give uh, respect to the fact that not everybody is uh, at that point where they, uh, you know, feel comfortable um, uh, doing that and is, uh, I'd be happy to participate with you if you want somebody to to uh, sit in and give um, moral support or, or ad ask a few questions that's not a problem for me uh, Maggie what do you think I was just gonna um, jump in I do agree with Caitlin that it would probably be easier um, at least, like, I know I have personal relationships from my high school that I could re reach out to. But I also see the benefit of, like, doing it in a partnership where it might be a little more formal in that sense, um, introducing someone new to the, like, interview. And it might be easier to, like, get all of the information. Mm -hmm. um, if we're not taking notes, then we could always, like, talk with our partner after um make sure we're getting everything that was said because i know it's sometimes hard to pick up on everything it is really yeah I, and i hope you can record it uh and use if you do use zoom that's an easy recording function um but uh and um if i were to participate i would i i think you could say i want to be the lead you know you, you could say i want to be the lead uh, mark you sit back and just uh um, be the, you know, the, um, the uh, support person. I, I, I could easily play that. So that's not a problem. But I do, I do want uh, you all to take the lead on this and uh, feel empowered to do it. Hey, Lauren, what do you think? Pretty similar to what Kaylin and Maggie have said. Mm -hmm. But I do think if like, 
we do teams maybe one person does the questioning mm -hmm. another person just transcribes the whole time yes oh which yeah could for then sure. maybe cut yeah, down that, on that, can, yeah. that. Yeah. yeah otherwise i um especially since we don't know if everybody will be able to get on zoom i think it would be best to do this i get solo you. thing and then come back and talk about it or like i said before like one person asks questions that person transcribes yeah. But that would mean like syncing up your schedule with another person, which can already is so stressful just to get somebody yeah. like you can talk to on the phone. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. I get you now. Yeah. Okay. There are, I'll just tell you, there are transcription services that like they charge like a dollar a minute or something. So, um, uh, you know, don't want to break the trust fund, but, you know, you could always try that if you wanted to um i've used them in the past uh it's pretty gruesome transcribing um so here's a couple of things i want to go over some tips about follow-up questions because it's not hard to ask the descriptive questions but i want to review some from aspects of uh interviewing that can be really useful <clears throat> one is uh, in the app in the when you're in the stage of decreasing apprehension um or any point of the interview and a person's talking and they're hesitating you can always be assuring and it's really important to assure assure people uh to decrease their apprehension you should please take your time don't feel rushed you know uh, and also assurance listening with verbal cues like uh-huh or, okay, I see. Those are really useful because they they communicate the person that you're that you're hearing and listening to them. So uh, assurance, giving assurance for you know, uh, and also with uh, verbal cues, especially when you're uh, when you're remote, because it's face it, it's hard. You can't really talk and look at the same time. I'm. I I always look at the picture and never at the camera, and uh, you know it's weird. So the other, the other technique that's really useful, and it's, it's fairly simple to state, sometimes difficult to do, is to restate exactly repeating every important element that they have stated and asking them if you have understood them correctly. This is a really tricky thing. So um, I could ask Maggie, for example, state exactly what I just said. Restate it. I oh, like actually. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, just that um, if I'm getting what you're saying correctly, that it's very important to be able to comprehend what the other person is saying and then be able to um, tell it back to them so it's an equal, so it's the understanding is um, comprehending. That's beautiful. And the thing that's beautiful about Maggie is you said, if I understand what you said correctly, it's like a little bit of an apology. And that is goes so far in uh, because it is important to restate it. And there's a couple of reasons that restating things is so useful. First of all, it gets the person, it really makes the person understand that they've been heard. And if you reuse their exact words, if you can think, oh, I'm, I'm going to restate this last thing and I'm going to use their exact words, then you can remember them. You can use their exact words and it really makes them feel like they've been heard. Uh, that's really important. The second thing, of course, is it gives them a chance to elaborate. And part of that elaboration is listening to what they just said through somebody else's mouth. So if you use the exact words, say, well, I didn't really mean, you know, <clears throat> Uh, you know, I didn't really mean to restate the words. What I meant to say is I'm going to, you know, and then they clarify it. And that is, that's like double. You really hit the jackpot there because you, you have interacted with the person. You've showed them the respect of being able to restate it. You've listened to them and then, but they've been able to clarify. So that's like a twofer right there. Um, Another one is uh, clarifying, is you clarifying something. This is a little trickier than just restating. Uh, and again, with apology, uh, like here's, here's what I suggest. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I caught that entirely. Would you mind providing me with more detail? It's just asking them for clarity. 
I'm sorry, I'm not sure I got it at all. Could you give me more detail about that? Or my favorite is, can you say more about that? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Can you say more about that? What that is, is you're, you're not saying that they did, weren't clear. You're saying that you didn't understand it. So you're avoiding judgmental words that may call into them into account, uh, like the dread word, why? Um, so you can say, I'm not sure I got it. Can you use, can you use a different word? Um, and then they can, they can clar clarify, they, they'll clarify. So. I have to head out now. Okay, so cool. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'll watch the rest though. Thanks. Okay, Bye -bye. and uh, give me a time when we can get together. Yes, I'll send an email with my Please. work from this week as well. Oh, so, thank you so much. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. bye. Okay, and then, uh, and then this is the t this is the most difficult one, is uh, with apology, uh, rephrasing in other words, uh, and then that way you separate the tone from the content. So, you know, a person can be very angry, for example, and you can rephrase what they say. And you can say, I, I hear you're, you're really angry. I hear your tone. And what, you, what I, I think you're angry at is that the person didn't listen to what you said and treated, really, treated you like you weren't important, as an example. So it separates, I, I, hear, I hear that you're angry, separates the tone from the content they weren't listening and they didn't treat you as if you, they respected you. So the rephrasing can be really important. Um, and then they can correct. And, and you're always using this apology framework. I'm not sure if I heard you correctly, you know. So those are five, four or five different techniques for uh, uh, interviewing skills to, for clarification. They take a long time to develop work. You know, if we had a, in a better world, we'd have a couple of hours, we could split into groups and practice them. Uh, but I think I hear a lot of you have this kind of grasp of this. So maybe we can uh, hope that it's just a review. Okay, so that's pretty much where we are for two o'clock. Um, any questions or comments? I can stay longer. I'm in not rush, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna, jam you guys up for time. Maggie? I love having so few people I can just say, Caitlin. <laughs> I think that's all good. Makes okay. sense. Okay. Okay. I will send you these documents, uh, the, the consent and the, uh, the introduction, uh, the, uh, what do we call it? Uh, the script, the short script. And you can start really thinking about going out and doing these things. And also give me, and Caitlin, if you would too, I would love to talk with you more about what you're interested in. Um, you know, even though you're in a different role than the other students, so. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, thanks a lot. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Yep. Bye.